First Frisco is an engaging, friendly atmosphere geared toward ministering to your entire family. We feel called to build a family of faith that reaches out to the world with the good news that Jesus loves everyone. As followers of Jesus, we are working to be disciples of Jesus Christ who make disciples of Jesus Christ. We engage in ministry that challenge us to serve and share in our neighborhood and beyond. Life Song is our contemporary worship experience at 9.30 a.m. each Sunday morning. We strive to provide a spirit-filled worship experience and are led in music by the Life Song worship team. We are also rich in history and tradition with an excellent traditional worship experience at our 11 a.m. service with music led by our chancel choir. Our messages are practical and grounded in scripture. We are blessed to have many new families joining our church. We would love for you to join as we connect to the kingdom of God and learn to follow Jesus. If you are looking for a church community where there is a family feeling and a commitment to Christ, I hope you will visit us soon. If you do, you just might find your family of faith. Church, will you stand with us? So good to see you here this Sunday morning. I want to say a special welcome to our visitors. Thank you for joining us. For those on live stream, we're so very glad you're here. It's going to be an incredible day of music and message. We even have a new song to introduce you to today. Let us sing and let us worship. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you.
Be seated, please. Hear these words. All of us at some point in our lives are going to encounter a time when we struggle with staying on the path that God has chosen for us. Amen? And this could be just because of the messiness of this life, or it could be because of our own bad choices. So what we hope today is that the words of this song, which we're going to be introducing to you today for the first time, will reach into your heart and will give solace to your spirit. And the prayer that I'm about to offer on our behalf are going to be the lyrics to this new song. So if you will, please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, through waters uncharted, my soul will embark. I'll follow your voice straight into the dark. And if from the course you intend I depart, please speak to the sails of my wandering heart. 
Like the wind, you'll guide, clear the skies before me, and I'll glide these open seas. Like the stars, your word will guide my voyage and remind me where I've been and where I am going. And all God's children said, Amen. Thank you. 
Jesus, my captain, my soul's trust in love. All my allegiance is rightfully yours. Guide me, O oh thy great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. We come this morning, bow down before the throne of God's grace. Thanking you, O oh God, that you've allowed us once more and again to gather together in this place to worship your awesomeness, to thank you for your goodness, to give thanks for your mercy. We come, Lord, and we praise you, not only for what you've done, but for who you are. We thank you, God, that you do guide us across the seas of this life, sometimes through turbulent waters, sometimes by the restful waves lining the beaches. Oh, God, we come this morning, and the week has been full and busy, and some of us come, Lord, and hearts heavy, minds scrambled, bodies tired. We come, Lord. We come to you for we know, oh God, that you are a comforter. You, oh God, are the one who gives us renewed strength. So, Lord, we come to you. Forgive us, oh God, for where we've fallen short of where you would have us to be, where we've sinned against your will, where we've not done what is pleasing in your sight. Forgive us, oh God, where we've doubted you, where we've been angry, when we didn't understand what was going on in our life. Forgive us, oh God. Help us, oh God, to draw nearer unto thee. For it is in your presence, it is beneath your wings and in your hands that we are again strengthened empowered, given comfort. It is also in your word, O oh God, that we find the words that will strengthen us, guide us, and comfort us. And there, O oh God, we find the prayers that you taught your disciples to pray. And we pray now, O oh God, the prayer that you taught your disciples when you ask them, Lord, teach us to pray. And you had them to say these words, Our Father, who art in heaven, <coughs> God, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen and amen. Welcome once, welcome twice, welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm so glad you are here, whether you're in this sanctuary or whether you've joined us on live stream. Turn to someone next to you, behind you or in front of you, and welcome them also in the house of God. Amen. All right, you guys are having way too much fun. As you find your way back to your seat, I'd like to invite the children to come down and uh, let's talk about a very special biblical character today. There they come. There they come.
good morning, everybody. Are you awake yet? No. You haven't had your coffee? Mm -hmm. Mom? Okay. So I want to talk to you about somebody in the Bible. Um, you all hear about biblical characters in the Bible a lot. And I'm just going to just tell you something that I've discovered in the Bible. There are more men biblical characters than there are women in the Bible. Have you ever noticed that? Now here's, here's a little secret, girls. Don't feel bad because there's also more bad men characters in the Bible than there are women bad characters in the Bible. But today, uh, I'm going to talk about the, a judge, a judge, you know, you, you all think about judges in courts, but judges worked a little different. You had Moses that led people out of the promised land, and then you had Joshua who led people into the promised land and took the land, and then Joshua died. And they kind of spread out, and they were living in the land, and so now you say, who's going to kind of lead us? Who's going to kind of connect to God and tell us what the right thing is to do? And so judges were raised up, usually when the people added bad, acted bad. And then God would send them a judge who would kind of tell them how to get out of their trouble. And the fourth judge that's mentioned, guess who it is? Her name was Deborah. Deborah. And Deborah is an awesome judge. She's clearly a spiritual leader. She's clearly connected to God. The guys even listen to her because she knows what she's talking about. And so I want you to understand that because a lot of times it can feel because it's easier to find male characters in the Bible and female characters that maybe God doesn't call girls to. Not true. Not true. Pay attention. So we're going to talk about Deborah today. So why don't you pray with me? Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus thank, you thank you for making me, for making me who, you made me who you made me to be. Help me, Help me. to listen to your call to listen to your and follow you my whole life, my whole life. for your glory. In Jesus' name. Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right. Go get your coffee there. Well, I have to tell you, I didn't have to cover four books of the Bible to deal with Deborah, but it was, in some ways, new territory. And I just have to tell you, I had a lot of fun, and I hope you enjoy what we talk about today, too. But I've just mentioned to the kids that... Um, Moses came out of Egypt and was sent back to Egypt to lead the people to the promised land. They wandered in the wilderness for 80 years. He died. Joseph uh, took over. He led them across the Jordan into the promised land. They conquered the promised land. He died. That's the beginning of Judges. And one of the problems is you've had the people moving around as a group. And it was really clear Moses is the spiritual leader. Moses wasn't really a military leader. He was sort of a military advisor. He was really a spiritual leader. Then Moses dies, and Joshua is clearly the spiritual leader. He also happens to be a military leader. And then they take over the land more or less effectively, more or less faithfully, and then Joshua dies. Now what? And one of the problem is, problems is... Uh, the people are now dispersed instead of moving around together, following a pillar uh, of fire at night and a pillar of cloud by day. They've been dispersed to their territories with all the problems that that entails. But they also are, are separated from each other. They also begin to kind of mix with the people of the land. And almost always that means forgetting who God is, forgetting that God is their only and primary devotion, and beginning to follow the gods of the people of the land. So this happens over and over again in Judges. Judges, after the death of Joshua, here's the pattern, and it keeps happening over and over and over again in Judges, because we're not going to talk about all the Judges. But here's what happens. The people disobey. They abandon God. God allows them to be delivered into their enemies' hands. They weep and wail and gnash their teeth, and then God raises up a judge and delivers them. That's kind of the recurring pattern that happens over and over in Judges. The fourth judge that's mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, is Deborah. And we're talking about Deborah today among all the judges in the book of Judges, specifically because Deborah's a woman. Specifically because Deborah's a woman. And this is an area that sometimes is kind of hard to get at 
um, the authority of women and, and sort of the call of, for leadership of women, the ordination of women, is sometimes a, a difficult topic to get at biblically, and it's really treated differently in different denominations. United Methodist Church, they've really the history of Methodism has a pretty specific way of approaching this, and it's anchored biblically. Some people say, well, let's just do this because we want to do this or because it feels right or because the culture is ready for it. No, it's anchored biblically, but it may be a little more complex than some of the other biblical issues. So stay with me on this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump down. The first uh, judge was Othniel, and then there was Ehud, then there was Shamgar, and then there's Deborah. Now, as you read through Judges, you're going to bump into characters like Samson, I mean, think Hulk Hogan or something like that. You know, think The Rock. And, and here's the thing. It's clear. It's clear that the Spirit comes upon Samson. And Samson is incredibly gifted. Samson is also incredibly self-absorbed. It's really not about God for Samson most of the time. It's about his appetites and his stupidity. He's got this incredible strength and giftedness, and he's usually not following God. That's not Deborah. So let's talk about Deborah. Judges chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. She pops on to the grid just kind of out of nowhere in chapter 4, and then her story is ended in chapter 5. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died, the previous judge. And this is, again, the familiar pattern. So... The Lord sold them into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hezor. The commander of his army was Sisera. Remember that name, Sisera, who lived in Herosheth HaGoim. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. Remember the pattern? You know, we've done bad. You sold us into the hand of our enemies. Now we're crying out because we don't like what we're dealing with. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900, this is Sisera, had 900 chariots of iron and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly for 20 years. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel. In other words, she just pops on the grid and it's understood she speaks with authority spiritually. It's never questioned, it's just announced. Here's who Deborah is. People understand it. Deborah is the spiritual authority at this time. So she used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came to her for judgment. In other words, if they had a dispute, they'd come to her. She would just settle the disputes. Kind of like you see King Solomon doing later on. So they would come to her for judgment. She sent, so, so now you've just met Deborah, and then all of a sudden, here's what happens. Deborah sends and summons Barak. Who's Barak? Well, you're about to find out. The son of Abinoam from Kadesh in Naphtali. And she said to him, the Lord God of Israel commands you. Does that sound pretty authoritative? Does Deborah have a little power? You're, you it sounds like she wants to be push people around, but the truth is you're going to find out that this is really the Lord's authority. She really knows what she's talking about. So the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go. Take position at Mount Tabor, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give you him into your hand. Pretty tough woman, huh? So she's not a warrior, but she's definitely a war advisor. And she's also a prophetess. She says, this is the time and this is what we need to do. And she's talking to the general of the armies. Barak clearly is somebody that she identifies as having military gifts that he's probably not using. We have a little indication later as to why maybe he's not using those. It's the same reason that many of us don't use our gifts. Am I on your toes yet? Give me time. I will be. All right. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, and I will give him into your hand. Barak said to her, listen to this. Listen how much he trusts Deborah. If you will go with me, I will go. 
but if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I surely will go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. Barak, maybe that's what you've been worried about. Maybe you're wanting to go to war for your glory, and if you're not going to have glory, you're not going to go. But it's not about you. It's about God's glory. This isn't going to be for your glory, but God's going to use you for his purposes. So get ready to go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. The Lord will sell Sisera, the commander of the enemy armies, into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah got up and went with Barak to Kadesh. Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, the two tribes she mentioned, to Kadesh, and 10,000 warriors went up behind him, and Deborah went up with him. This is the word of the Lord. Now, I'm not going to follow the story, the biblical account, uh, much further, but I'll give you Cliff's notes. You ready? Israel's army won. Deborah knew what she was talking about. Um, the enemy general, Sisera, escaped, and he sought refuge in a tent. He hid. He ran, and he hid in the tent. And a woman that you meet, you haven't met before, Jael, she drives a tent peg through his temple. There's the end of Sisera. Thus ended the lesson. But anyway, Barak doesn't get the credit. Deborah directs his efforts. Jael kills the general. But Deborah clearly is functioning as the one who is connected to God. So here he is. Je Deborah is a judge. She's a prophet. She, she sees, kind of, she senses what God, where God is leading people and what they need to do. And she's a military advisor. Deborah's role as judge is simply a stated fact. It's simply the reality that's understood in the people, with the people at the time. Deborah's prophetic insight is bold. A lot of people have prophetic insight that's bold. Deborah's is also accurate. Very important. Deborah's insight extends to perceiving the gifts of others. She knows that Barak is the one who's supposed to lead the armies, even though maybe he's not ready to do it. He's not ready to step into his role. But Deborah sees what, how God has gifted him and what he has the potential to do. Deborah's insight extends to perceiving the weaknesses of others as well. She sees Barak's Achilles heel, which is he wants his own glory. Deborah is Israel's spiritual leader, not because she's a woman. Deborah is the spiritual leader because she's gifted, she's called, and she's surrendered to operating in her area of giftedness for the glory of God and for the building up of the people of God. I'm a student of leadership. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm a great leader. That just means I'm a student of leadership. I love seeing great leaders. Great leaders aren't just famous people Great leaders are people who show up at a particular point in time, in particular circumstances, and they make a difference that reaches beyond them. So, um, you, I, I kind of grew up in, in sort of swimming in the waters of leadership, sports, scouts, the Navy, and so you learn to recognize great leaders. So, I mean, I really respect, for different reasons, people like George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, but then we can jump the pond Admiral Horatio Nelson, the Duke of Wellington, Winston Churchill, William Wilberforce. Sounds like a bunch of old white guys, doesn't it? Leadership is not a respecter of color. So, I mean, if you, if you go to the Bible, then Saint, uh, the Apostle Paul, St. Basil the Great, St. Patrick, John Wesley, Francis Asbury, E. Stanley Jones. But because I'm a, a, a student of leaders, I also respect people like Booker T. Washington, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela. Great leaders. Chief Osceola of the Seminole, Quanah Parker of the Comanche, Joseph, Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce, Chief Red Cloud of the Sioux. They weren't just chiefs, they were great leaders. If you go and study their lives, you'll see um, they did some incredible things. Because I'm a student of leadership, I also have great admiration for Joan of Arc and Harriet Tubman and Mother Teresa, Queen Elizabeth, Gold of My Ear, Margaret Thatcher. I want to talk about somebody today that's kind of recently popped on my grid, and I'm embarrassed to say it because it's one of the most remarkable historical figures I've ever discovered. You ready? You ready? Some of you know this person. She's incredible. Her name is Bessie Coleman. Bessie Coleman was born in uh, January 26, 1892. Guess where? 
Atlanta, Texas. Bessie Coleman was born January 26, 1892 in Atlanta, Texas. She was the 10th of 13 children. Her family moved to Waxahachie two years later. This is 1894. Now I'm going to give you a few more details about Bessie Coleman. She was the daughter of sharecroppers of African-American and Cherokee heritage. She grew up as a kid, very early, working in Texas cotton fields. She started attending a small one-room segregated school when she was six. She had to walk to school four miles a day to get there. How many of you kids love walking four miles a day to school? Bessie did, and she was excited. She was great. She loved to read, and she was outstanding at math. At 12, she received a scholarship to Missionary Baptist Church School. Everybody didn't get to go to school all the way through the 12th grade back then. And then, remember, schools were segregated and the educational opportunities were much, much worse for African Americans. So she received a scholarship. She finished her schooling at the Missionary Baptist School. And then she went for one term to Langston University in Oklahoma, which was a segregated university. Um, And she was there for one term until the money ran out. And she couldn't stay in school, even though she was a great student. So she went back home. In 1916, this was the height of World War I, at 24 years of age now, she moved to Chicago to live with her brothers. And she worked as a manicurist at the White Sox Barbershop. Does that sound like a remarkable life to you? She's surviving. That was remarkable at times. But stick with the story. She heard stories of pilots returning from World War I. She took a second job to earn money for flight training. However, I know this will probably come no surprise to you, American flight schools did not admit women. They didn't admit any African Americans. Didn't happen. Robert Abbott, who was the founder and publisher, do we have that picture? Were you able to get those images? Look at that. Show them the other one. Beautiful woman. She heard stories. Robert Abbott, who is the founder and publisher of the Chicago Defender, heard about her goal, and he encouraged her to leave America for training. And he publicized this big quest of hers, and a banker and the newspaper sponsored her. So she learned French. She learned French. And she traveled to France, and in seven months, she earned her pilot's license through the Federation Aeronautique Internationale, June 15, 1821. This was within a year after women of any color just got the right to vote. Think about that. She spent the next two months taking lessons from a French World War I ace, and she returned to America in September as a media sensation. Remember, the papers were kind of following her story. But it wasn't enough. In those days, they didn't have commercial airline pilots. She wanted to make a living as a pilot, and it's not like you could go sign on with American Airlines and and make a living. The only way to make a living as a pilot in those days was as a barnstormer, somebody who was a stunt pilot who went around the country risking their life in these rickety airplanes that had only been flying, you know, for a few years. So she realized um, that with all of these returning World War I fighter pilots, she didn't have the chops to compete with them yet. So in February of 1922, she sailed back to France for advanced training. Then she sailed to the Netherlands to meet Anthony Falker, one of the most distinguished aircraft designers. And then she went on to Europe excuse me, to Germany to visit the Fokker Corporation and receive additional training. She performed at her first air show on September 3, 1922 at an event honoring veterans of the all-black 369th Infantry Regiment. Think about the obstacles this young, cotton-chopping girl from Texas just refused to even acknowledge. It was amazing. It was amazing. For the next five years, she performed as Queen Bess. She began as a novelty, but pretty soon all of the pilots 
respected her skill and her, her fearlessness. She championed aviation and she combat, combated racism. Everywhere she went, she was encouraging people to get into aviation. She was encouraging young people um, to not let obstacles stand in their way. And she absolutely refused to participate in events that banned African-American attendance. That was a lot of events in those days. Remarkable. Remarkable. Bessie died in a crash in Jacksonville, Florida, April 30, 1926. She was, it was due to mechanical fail, failure of a newly acquired airplane. Her scheduled routine, routine for the next day also included a parachute jump. A remarkable, remarkable woman. She was also connected to the, um, to the Baptist church for her whole life. 10,000 people attended her memorial ceremonies in Chicago. 10,000 people. The other day, is for the coin toss for the Super Bowl, how many of you watched the coin toss for the Super Bowl? They had a living legend, a true hero. Sometimes we use those words kind of indiscriminately. There was a true hero, uh, a living legend, who was part of the coin toss. Also an honored guest at the State of the Union address this past week. His name was Charles McGee. Charles McGee is the last of the Tuskegee Airmen of World War II. A lot of people say, who's that? You know, you've heard of a lot of units. Um, the Tus Tuskegee Airmen were an all-black fighter squadron who flew uh, P-51 Mustangs at the very end of the war. Um, Charles McGee flew 130 combat missions in World War II, continued to serve in Korea and Vietnam. Even as he would return from wars where he had fought uh, to represent and defend this country, and then he would run smack dab into the ongoing racism that existed in his home country. It's a great story. Initially, as the T Tuskegee Airmen were fighting um, to be able to participate in the war, it's a, there's a movie, you can go watch the movie. It's a great historical story. It's not a great movie, but it's a good movie. But by war's end, they had become the fighter escort group most feared by German pilots. American bomber crews were always excited to see the famed red tails on their wing. The Tuskegee Airmen gave them their very best chance of getting home alive. They really did. They were brave and they were fearless. And by the end of the war, they were loved by those bomber crews because most of them were, were really in danger. They, they just didn't make it very long. The Tuskegee Airmen credit Bessie Coleman as one of their greatest inspirations because she broke the barrier to be pilot before any of the men did. No American woman of any race ever had the right to vote until August 18, 1920. By that time, Bessie was on her way to getting her pilot's license. I just want to talk to you about the fact of, I mean, we, if you look around, and you all know, we have a lot of really strong women um, in this room today. But sometimes we can get our biblical view of women confused. And so I'm going to talk just about scripture in general and um, scriptural study uh, in particular, um, there are a couple of terms, you know, Sarah's in seminary right now. You can't be in seminary without bumping into these terms. And one of the first terms um, that you learn is exegesis, E-X-E-G-E-S-I-S, -E 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 -S -S. exegesis. It means to understand what the text says, to go read the Bible to find out what the text says. Now, the reason why that's a challenge is because when I come to read the Bible, I bring all of my life experience with me. So what I tend to do is isogesis, which means I tend to read into the text me. I tend to make the text say what I want it to say instead of hearing what the text actually says. Another problem in scriptural study is something called proof texting which means I take my favorite verse and I lock on to that and I say, this is what the Bible says about this subject. An authority of women is a dangerous place for proof texting because you can find one verse that may seem, seem to kind of just end the debate and you miss maybe the larger point of the authority of women. 
the place of women in leadership in the church that's in the Bible. So here's our biblical view. Let's kind of go back to the beginning. Oh, it happens to be the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. You think that might have something to say? Genesis 127. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Who's made in the image of God? All of us. All of us. Hold on to that. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says when he's talking about spiritual giftedness, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Everybody's gifted spiritually, and the purpose of those gifts is for the common good, not for self-glorification. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. So you are gifted spiritually. I'm gifted spiritually. We don't really get to choose the spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts that we have, we have to choose to be developed. But everybody's gifted spiritually. It says in Scripture that women and men are made to be complementary. It says that women are different from men. I mean, you know, all women are not the same and all men aren't the same, but, you know, there's some wonderful differences there. Men and women both have their vulnerabilities. I could go on for days about the vulnerabilities of men. So could their wives, all right? Proverbs 31 uh, is a great, it, it talks about the, the godly woman. And a lot of times people will read that and then will say, oh, well, the quaint little housewife. Go back and read it again. There's nothing that this woman doesn't do for her household, for her husband. She's an entrepreneur. She's a manager. She's incredible. Yes, she's a wonderful wife and mother, but she's so much more. Sometimes we look at particular passages of the Bible that I think are really intended to be wonderful gifts of understanding um, how God is supposed to make a difference in the world because we are supposed to be salt and light in the world. One of those subjects that oftentimes kind of, I think women in particular feel like it's sort of a poke in the eye, but I don't think it needs to be, is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 25, and a lot of times it's, the heading is, the rules for the Christian household. So let me just read this passage, and let's talk about it, and then let's remember the context in which it's given. It says, be subject to one another out of reference, out of reverence for Christ. That's just the opening. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Then it starts going into specifics. And I'm going to stop after wives and husbands. This is wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is the Savior. And a lot of women may already feel like they're writhing or being put into a box. But let's go on. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. Then it goes on. Husbands. Husbands. Love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Those things always have to be held together. And the other thing you have to understand is that Paul is reaching people for the body of Christ in the Greco-Roman world in which women are property. What is remarkable in that passage to someone who would have heard it in Paul's day is the admonition, the responsibility for husbands to love their wives. I don't need to love you if I'm a Greco-Roman man. I have all the power and you have none. And I can just treat you however I want to. And Paul says that's absolutely not true. We're all subject to each other in Christ. So sometimes these seemingly airtrite pro- uh, prohibitions in the Bible against women in leadership, one of them uh, that famously gets pointed to is in 1 Corinthians where Paul specifically And not so many words says, you know, women ought to sit down and shut up. I mean, I'll just say, you can go find it for yourself. It's 1 Corinthians 14, 34. Women should be silent in churches, for they are not permitted to speak. Now, if you compare this admonition from Paul to the church in Corinth and look at the way he encouraged and depended on women in leadership in other churches and compare this passage with the whole of the New Testament witness, it's pretty clear that he was dealing with a specific situation that was unique to Corinth. Galatians 3.28. There's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. 
So when it comes to the authority of women, when it comes to leadership of women in the church, I think there's a very, very strong biblical argument for women in leadership in the church, but it's not it's a little more complex, and if you go into proof texting, you're going to miss the point altogether. John Wesley is the founder of the Methodist movement, and John Wesley and Charles Wesley both had parents, had lots of brothers and sisters. Uh, John and Charles were both really, really influential in the Methodist movement, as you can imagine. It's clear, if you read the story of John's life, that his mother, Susanna, was much more influential as a spiritual leader in his life than his father. Not throwing his dad under the bus, but Susanna was amazing. Susanna was amazing. Women in ministry in the Methodist movement, I want to do a little historical perspective just because sometimes we can lose track of it. Mary Busoke Fletcher, 1739 to 1815, was an early lay preacher, and she was credited with convincing John Wesley that some women should be allowed to preach. John Wesley heard her preach. John Wesley probably heard of a lot of the men preach. And he says, some women should be allowed to preach. Women were ordained as ministers as early as the late 19th century. In 1866, Helen M. Davison was ordained a deacon in the Methodist Protestant Church. Methodist Protestant Church combined with the Methodist Episcopal South and North in 1939 to become the Methodist Church. Anna Howard Shaw, after being refused ordination by the General Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church in 1880, that same year joined the Methodist Protestant Church and was ordained by its New York Annual Conference. Ella Niswanger, I don't know, she's probably not around to care if I misspell, uh, pronounce her name. Ella was the first woman granted full clergy rights by the United Brethren Church in 1889, the group that uh, formed with the Methodist Church in 68 to make the United Methodist Church. Sometimes, uh, in 1956, the Methodist Church granted women clergy, uh, women full clergy rights. Sometimes this history in Methodism can be a little jarring to folks who find a home in the Methodist Church after spending time in a denomination that does not ordain women. But what I would say is, is don't get the idea that one group is listening to the Bible and one group isn't. Stick with it. Find, really find out the scriptural anchor for this for yourself. So now I'm just going to move on to leadership. The real leadership issue in the church over the centuries has not been whether women served in a vital leadership role. Women have served, this is, this is Mark, women have served a more consistent role in church leadership over the years than men. Whether or not they were able to serve in all positions or authorized to be ordained as pastors. I know that's a bold statement, but I've seen it in action. The real leadership variable has been the presence or absence of male leadership in churches. It's not either or, it's both and. And the most often the one that's missing has been strong male leadership. I have never seen a functioning church that did not have strong female leaders. I've never seen a functioning church that did not have strong female leaders. I've seen many churches that lacked strong male leadership. Pastor Steve and I can both attest to surviving in times of difficult ministry only because a woman district superintendent had our backs. Is that fair, Steve? Every morning you all have the privilege of seeing uh, clergy women in in, uh, living color because you see Cheryl, Pastor Cheryl, every Sunday morning. Leaders are easy to identify. Do you know how you identify a leader? They have followers. The question for a leader is, where are they going? Where are they going? I know a lot of gifted leaders that are going in the wrong direction. Great leaders are known by the direction and purpose of their leadership. It's not about them. People are not qualified to be great leaders because they are either a woman or a man. I've known some male clergy who really ought to turn in their ordination credentials. And we've been ordaining women long enough to know that I could say the same thing about a few women. We have enough history with both. People are great leaders because they are gifted by God, like Deborah. They're called by God, like Deborah. They're surrendered for God's purposes. They're committed to God's glory, not their own glory. And they're committed committed to lifting up God's people. All people are created in the image of God. All people are gifted spiritually. 
And I would say all people are called, just not all to the same ministry. Here's my challenge for you today. Women and men. Accept that you are called by God. Accept that you're gifted spiritually. Surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Study the Word of God. Make it active in your life. Don't just wait on somebody else to tell you what it says. Surrender your spiritual gifts for God's glory and for the building up of the body of Christ, His church. You were called. Will you answer? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your faithfulness. Thank you for Deborah. Thank you for the modern day Deborahs and Joshuas. Lord, may it be so. In Christ's name, amen. Thank God for Jesus. And thank God for the leadership of so many down the ages. And it was at this table that we've all been fed. It's at this table that we too are fed to go out and continue to do the work that God called us to, that we've been gifted with, and that we have rendered to. And so it is now that we offer an opportunity to come to the table and thanks to Jesus Christ for what he did for us on the cross. On the night in which Christ died for us, he sat at a table with his disciples, broke bread, gave thanks, and offered to his disciples, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. And after the supper was over, he took cup. And he gave thanks for it likewise. <coughs> and he offered it to his disciples. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for forgiveness of sin. Thank you all of it. And we've been called to do this. Not every Sunday, not once a month. But he said, as often as you do, do it in remembrance of me. And so as you come, remember what Christ has done. Not only are you on the cross, but what he has done for you in your life. And then seek forgiveness as you come. Seek strength. Ask God to show you what you've been called to do. This house, for this community, in the name of Jesus. Would you pray with me? Yes, and Heavenly Father, we come now and we just say thank you for another opportunity to kneel at your altar, to break bread with one another, and to receive. In your name we pray. Amen. As those who helping serve come forward, I would remind you that this is an open table. The United Methodist Church uh, does not reject you because you're not a member of this church or you're not a member of the United Methodist Church. It is an open table. to God's call. Won't you come in Christ? All has been made ready.
Today, I have the privilege of introducing the new, newest member of the family, Mary Seville. Actually, her son and daughter-in-law and, and grandson joined last week, and so I'm just going to ask her the last vow of the church uh, as a member of First Frisco. You, will you support it by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? She will, so it's up to us. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love of members together with you in the body of Christ and in First Frisco United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Please come by to greet Mary on your way out, and Pastor Cheryl's going to take her to get her picture. All right, so... Notice some tables out there today. Stop by and look at the youth stock table. Any stock that is purchased, a lot of you are very supportive of the youth goes to help our youth summer mission trips. So stop by and be a stockholder. Uh, also, Shrove Tuesdays, not that far away. We'll have a pancake supper on that Tuesday before Ash Wednesday. Uh, we'll have Ash Wednesday services at 7 and then uh, come as you are, ashes at 7, noon, and 2.45. All that's in your bulletin, and it's on the website as well. The United Methodist women are having a dinner and a guest speaker on the 18th of February. And finally, if you would like to sing in the choir cantata for Easter, uh, they start rehearsals at the end of the month. And so that's also in your bulletin, that information. First time guests, thank you for being with us today. We'd love to greet you. We have a gift at the table, out the doors. If you would stop by so we could thank you for being with us. Would you hear and receive this benediction? 
Oh God, we thank you for strong leaders. We thank you for Deborah and the witness of her leadership. And as we leave this place today, you call us individually to lead in our own special giftedness. We pray in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.